I want the guard house. Place it and assemble the guard detail every day. Weapon. We keep a lot of our weapons today. Um, unlike the 17th century, we don't have 50 people, or you know, 150 people living in the fort to keep their weapons at their houses anymore. And uh, when we get a couple thousand kids walking through the, on a daily basis, we keep the weapons in the houses where the kids can get to them. But they would have been keeping their weapons and equipment in their houses where they live, next to their beds, easy access. Men would report here for guard duty about an hour or so before sunrise, serving a 12 or 24 hour shift. Captain of the launch would be posted in here and then assign them to different positions, centers on the walls, rounders patrolling the reserves inside this building. And then you would also assign the rotations that they don't ever have to stand out there for too long. If you're stand out there too long and get wet, cold, or hot, and miserable in the summer, so you want to be able to rotate in a couple of hours to give everyone a chance to take a break, rest, relax, and recover from what they are otherwise having to deal with in the extremes of Virginia. But they're, uh, they're going to serve as guards in case they're attacked by the Spanish or the Powhatans. These are two groups of people that are threatening them here in Virginia. Between the two, they're most concerned with the Spanish invasion, considering Spain's the largest empire in the world at this point. And in addition to that, can bring artillery, head cavalry, heavy infantry, and, and muskets to bear. All of which are very deadly. Against the Powhatans, however, they're mostly using bows and arrows. So while the Powhatans are a very real and very present threat, the Spanish are still the more, more of the concern. At least early on. Now, eventually, they, they go to war with the Palatines in 1610, and as the Spanish increasingly seems though they're not going to be able to success, success, successfully attack the fort, they do focus a lot of their efforts into dealing with the Palatines over the Spanish. So they'll start importing equipment and gear to deal with specific Palatine threats, like the armor you see in the back there. Whereas most of the men would have on European battle have worn plate armor, the quilted mail and the quilted in the mail over there are old fashioned styles of armor that, while not effective on a European battlefield, will be effective against native arrows here. In addition, you're mostly using the matchlock musket. The musket fires a 75 to 80 caliber lead ball intended to kill horses or bring down men in armor on a European battlefield. This is a bit overkill if you're trying to kill a human being, unarmored human being. So they start seeing a lot of them bringing over calibers, which are firing a 60 caliber ball, a smaller round. Not very useful in the European battlefield since it doesn't go through the armors effectively, but very effective here against the natives because you're still getting a, a, larger, a large enough round to, to take out a human being in a single shot as opposed to having to deal with um, the palatine problem, which is you gotta hit the target in a very precise location, mostly the organs and the chest, the abdomen and the head, all of which are covered in armor. And since the English armor is made out of iron or the quilt of jack of the mail over there, the arrows tend to just bounce right off. So the English are pretty safe while they're wearing the armor here in Virginia. And so that, generally speaking, covers the equipment they're using. They are using a bandolier system to load and fire their muskets. It gives them about a 20 second reload time. In addition to that, they also carry a sword on their person because there are no bayonets yet. So everybody has a sword as a secondary weapon in the event that they engage in hand to hand combat with the opponents. That's a lot of materials. Does anyone have any questions about anything I've covered so far? Any questions about the fort in general? Are most of the weapons made here, or just imported? Imports. Everything's being made back in England by professionals. You have gunsmiths back in England making guns. You have armorers back in England making armor. You have sword cutlers in England are making these swords. And all the different pieces and equipment are made back in England by professionals who are experts in that field. And mass, not mass produced, but make a great deal of that. And then, of course, also, they're going to tend to have a lot more surplus, so you can buy a lot cheaper stuff back in England to try to import an entire industry of Virginia. In addition, if you import the industry of Virginia fails and you don't have the weapons, it's kind of a problem. You want everything ready to fight as soon as you arrive? Much like if we sent troops to Afghanistan today, we wouldn't ship the whole factory from South Carolina to Afghanistan. We'd have the weapons made in, Afghanistan, in, in South Carolina and then put them on a plane and send them to Afghanistan, right? Same concept. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, when were the like, spear type weapons up there commonly used? The pikes are commonly used on the European battlefield to deal with cavalry and heavy infantry, and that's going to be true all the way up through the mid part of the century. It isn't until the end of the 17th century, the end of the 1600s, that you start seeing pikes being pulled off the battlefield, largely because of the invention of the, bay of the bayonet. As you have a bayonet, you think about what these things are, you boil them down to the very essence. It's a wooden stick with a pointy end. I put a spear point on the end of this, I put a bayonet on the end of this, all it is is a wooden stick with a pointy end. They do the same job. So the idea is now I don't have to give every man a, a sword and, and a pipe. Instead, I can make sure that I have an entire army fielding nothing but muskets, they have a bayonet, they have a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon available to them, and that is what they need. That's to make an effective soldier. So by the end of the century, they do switch over from the pikes to the bayonets and muskets. 
but that yeah, that's a slow process that takes a long time. But cavalry are still the dominant force. Cavalry will run down musketeers. They will drive through any force that isn't properly equipped to deal with cavalry. Pikes are what you need to stop those. You have 15 to 20 foot long thrusting spears used by men who are essentially linebackers. Um, put in perspective, I'm small for a pikeman. Pikemen should be my size or bigger. And those pikemen are standing in formation, in line, uh, with their bit, with their must, their pikes similar to this, basically crouched down with the point angled out towards the chest level of a horse, and they are uh, in formations, blocks of, of 50 to 100, 150 to Spanish tercios that could consist of a thousand. You know, Spanish tercio, when it gets into a straight line, can stretch for about a mile, and that's one tercio. The Spanish can field armies of you know, many tercios. Um, so the Spanish, again, big threat, big problem. Worried about them attacking the English here in Virginia. There's, there's a big concern about that. Uh, yeah, cavalry are still the dominant force, but increasingly infantry are able to deal with them. So you're starting to see the switch to infantry tactics more and more. Any other questions? Uh, how's the accuracy on those? The effective range of a musket is 100 yards, at which I can hit a human being-sized target with a 75 to 80 caliber musket ball. So I'm not precision targeting, I'm not hitting a precision target, I'm not trying to aim for a bullseye. If I hit you as a human being with a round intended to kill a horse, I don't have to hit you anywhere specific, I just have to hit you. You're going to go into shock, your body's going to start to shut down, you're going to be at least out of the battle if you don't bleed out or die from the trauma. So, yes? Were women allowed to have these weapons? Allowed? Um, or did they? They didn't typically. They, the women here in Virginia, sort of, you can tell there were no women fighting as part of the English forces here. We do know of it, plenty of instances in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, especially where women sneak into militaries and serve. There was one woman part of the Spanish army for, she goes in and becomes an officer, and she serves as an officer for about, like, 20, 30 years. And eventually they find out after she has to have a medical, uh, some medical thing happens to her. And when they finally figure out, it was such an embarrassment for the Spanish army that they just gave her retirement benefits and sent her away. Because they didn't want to let everybody know that a woman had been leading a massive portion of the Spanish army for you know, the better part of a couple of decades. But it happens, it's just not frequent. And usually you have to be able to be on a At this time, one of the problems is that you have to have the physical mass to be able to be on a battlefield. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's not that it's impossible, it's just you have to have the right people. Right. And there's also a lot of men who can't be on the battlefield because they're just too small. You need big people because this is all infantry tactics, hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, you know, like I said, the, the, the pikemen are linebacker size. Um, the next tier below that are musketeers, which are firing a uh, musket like this. This is a 14-pound firearm. Right. You have to be able to march around with it, walk for 25 miles a day. You have to be able to fire it. I mean, Rob here is still kind of a smaller end to be using one of these. No offense, Rob. No, no. <laughs> but it's still a bit of the smaller end to be using one of these, so you still need people who are reasonably large. You do have calibers, which are light infantry, and you have a lot of ditch diggers, you have the, the sappers. But, you know, again, as you get to the smaller size of human beings, it's just you start to run out of the range in which they're effective on the battlefield. So, they, they, you know, they still have uses, but women typically are kept kind of the rear. And, and out of out of harm's way. And here in Virginia, there's aren't many to speak of during the first initial conflict with the natives. Um, the first two women arrived in 1608. It's Mistress Forrest, the wife of the gentleman, and Anne Burris, her maid servant. Uh, and a few women will trickle in periodically, mostly as wives of gentlemen, as far as we can tell. So there really isn't a lot of evidence that you know, any any women who are of a lower status, mostly just gentlemen, who you know, can, can usually pay for their own passage and take care of themselves in the state. So. Any other questions at all? Were the cans used for like mostly against Spanish or like attack or Yeah, artillery are typically used against the Spanish attacks, the larger artillery. The smaller artillery can be used against the pallets and assaults as well. Because you can load a case shot, which is a wooden cylindrical tube filled with bullets, fire it out, opens up, and then sprays bullets towards the other. And uh, at 24 yards, you can get eight foot cone of 72 rounds flying through that space. So it's pretty deadly. Thank you. Thank you.